Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Can you boost mental clarity and physical performance through your breath? I'm back today with Patrick McEwen, an international authority on therapeutic breathwork and the best-selling author who's coached elite military units, athletes, and executives for over 20 years on how to leverage breath work to improve performance. Today, we're discussing the connection between the breath, our mind, and body, and how breathing impacts our physiology, our ability to regulate our state, and how we can leverage the breath to improve our everyday performance. Listen, this isn't a biohack, folks. This stuff works. And I highly recommend you listen to what he's saying and make the switch to nasal breathing during exercise, sleep, and daily functioning. All right, let's get right to my conversation with Patrick. So let's lean in and learn from the best. Can we talk about maybe breathing pattern for regulating your state of arousal? Totally. I'll give you an example. I work with snipers. These guys are highly trained individuals. They're sent into stressful situations. And typically you pull the trigger between your heartbeats. So you can imagine going into a hot environment, you're in a difficult situation, and there's a certain amount of stress and your heart rate is elevated. Maybe it's 130, maybe it could be 140 beats per minute. That's going to affect your decision-making, your shot. So we show, in order to bring down your heart rate, you're taking a soft breath in through your nose, and you're really having a slow and relaxed and a gentle exhalation. So by having the slow and relaxed and gentle exhalation, you stimulate the vagus nerve, which secretes acetylcholine, which is causing your heart rate to slow down. And just towards the bottom of the, of the breath, you take the shot in between the heartbeats because just towards the bottom of the breath, the time difference beat to beat is longer. And that's where you're looking to take the shot. And if you don't take the shot there, you're waiting until the next breath. So you can imagine somebody going to do a free kick and they're feeling a lot of psychological pressure and they're feeling their heart rate is elevated. And even in just a few seconds, as they're sizing up the ball, taking attention out of the mind and onto the breath and into the body to anchor attention on the breath, taking that soft breath in through the nose and that really slow, relaxed, gentle breath out and doing it for just a few moments to self-regulate, putting the critical mind aside and then taking the kick with every cell of your body. You know, so that would be an example. Going into meetings the same, anything that's a little bit stressful that we feel that we're beginning to hyperventilate, use the breath to calm down. I love it. It also brings your awareness to something you can control. Instead yes. of focusing on these things that factors you can't control, it's also a mindfulness or awareness practice because you're like, okay, I have a, a mechanism. I can focus on that physical sensation. We know that this isn't a biohack. This is changing physiology, but it also brings your mind to the moment. Sir Chris Hoy, greatest Olympic cyclist of all time. Great story. He's talking about what it felt like to race in Olympic finals. And he said it felt like he was going to the gallows. But, I mean, this is the greatest cyclist ever. But then he talks about how he would like focus on his hands on the steering wheel or his feet in the clips. He was shifting his attention. And I think this really kind of brings up my next question for you. There's a connection between the breath, the mind, this kind of mind-body connection. Can you go into that a little bit deeper? Oh, it's huge. And we have to tie in sleep there because how many athletes are waking up at a dry mouth in the morning? How many athletes are not getting the optimal sleep quality? So if your sleep quality isn't good, it's going to impact your mind. You're more likely to live in your head when you're feeling fatigued. You're more likely to be ruminating in thought. So when your sleep is off, your mind is off. But when your mind is off, it can impact your breathing because you're less likely to cope with difficult situations you're more likely to procrastinate when your concentration is affected. So when your sleep is off, your breathing is off. When your breathing is off, your sleep is off. When your mind is off, your breathing is off. When your mind is off, your sleep is off. They're all three are interconnected. So the mind-body connection is not just about observation of the breath. That's one thing. Yes, focused attention. When you have your attention out of your mind and on the breath, it helps to develop your ability to hold your attention on one thing, which is very important. And you can then transfer that to other skills, such as if you're in a game or doing whatever you're doing, that you don't want your mind wandering. If the mind is wandering, it's game over. You need that focused attention. But it's more about the physiology of it. 
Because if you're breathing faster and harder and upper chest breathing, that in turn, your body is telling the brain that your body's under threat and your brain wants you to get out of the situation and it launches you into a fight or flight response. When you breathe light, or if you do physical exercise with your mouth closed, and carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood because it's not able to leave the body so quickly enough. And as carbon dioxide increases in the lungs and then on, in the blood, your blood circulation will increase and you've got increased blood flow to the brain, but you've also got increased oxygen delivery to the brain. And this is having a calming effect on the central nervous system and the brain. There's a paradigm by a psychiatrist called Dr. Michael Binder, and he speaks about neuronal excitability. And none of this is new, but even back in 1924, it has been shown that increased neuronal excitability is a result of hyperventilation. And then there was a paper written back in 1988 by Samyun and Balestrino, and I wrote about the paper in the book Anxiety Free in 2010. And then I heard Dr. Andrew Huberman talking about the paper, and I said, I know that paper. <laughs> and I went, I went and I looked at the book, and the exact sentence that he spoke in his podcast on breathing was the exact sentence that I had in the book. And it said the brain, by controlling breathing, regulates its own excitability. That's more than observation of the breath. And when we think about people with panic disorder and anxiety, 75% of them have dysfunctional breathing. 75%. What does dysfunctional breathing mean? Your breathing is a little bit faster and harder and upper chest and or regular and mouth breathing. Now, if you change your breathing patterns, you can help to physiologically bring the body and mind into a state of balance, to dampen the stress response, to increase the relaxation response. So we talk about light, slow, and deep. Light is about the biochemical dimension of breathing, improving your blood circulation and improving oxygen delivery to the brain. Slow is about helping to bring the body and mind into balance. Deep is about good recruitment of the diaphragm. So an easy way to remember it is LSD. And it's not just about having this during rest, but it's also about carrying it into physical exercise, especially during the low to moderate intensity exercise, the stuff that you're able to cope with nasal breathing. The benefits of the nose to the mouth, there is no comparison. The mouth has very few functions when it comes to the breath, other than it's a hole. So think of your mouth as a hole where air can go straight down your throat into your lungs. But other than that, your mouth is done zilch with your breathing. Zilch. Your nose does everything. And an American ENT back in the 70s, Dr. Morris Cottle, he said that the human nose was responsible for 30 functions in the human body. And this is back in the 1970s. And I was wondering, like, where is the list? I couldn't find it. So I ended up compiling my own list and 30 functions easily. So there's likely to be a lot more. And even in physical exercise, the benefits of improved recruitment of the diaphragm, increased gas exchange, increased oxygen delivery to the tissues, fast recovery post-physical exercise, improved visual spatial awareness, and breathing and movement go together. So if the breathing is dysfunctional, movement is dysfunctional. And from a biochemical point of view, if you have dysfunctional breathing, you're more likely to gas out. From a biomechanical point of view, if you have dysfunctional breathing, you're more likely to get injured and have lower back pain. A study of 1,933 individuals in Japan, athletes, how many of them had dysfunctional breathing from a biomechanical point of view? 90%. Mm. 90%. I'll tell you what, I just did a podcast recently with a friend of mine, Jim Laird. If you don't know Jim, you should connect with him. And we were talking about, so when I was in human performance for almost two decades, we would tell our athletes, Stand up tall. Don't show any sign of weakness. And now we're like, we know that bending over, <laughs> like Michael Jordan, right? He had it right. You know, he would hands on knees. But nobody ever taught me how to breathe. And it's kind of like how insane it is that nobody ever trained my eyes. When I was working with Nike, I met Dr. Alan Ryko, who basically built the old entire Nike Vision Lab. If those two things aren't right, nothing's right. If you can't breathe, you're dead. And it, we would focus on the macro muscles, which are important. Sometimes ignoring the nervous system would drives the muscles. And here you're saying, which is true, that the breath drives the nervous system excitability. Because if you're hypoxic, your nervous system saying, hey, we got a problem here. And so it all makes sense. 
And I'm so glad that when we talked earlier, you're talking about, you know, the people in the robes and the beads and oftentimes people that are, are kind of out there, are the first ones to grasp onto uh, an idea because they've experimented with so many things, right? But I'm so thankful for people like you that have, have done the hard research and that have, have packaged it. Can you talk about your app for a second? It's amazing. It's free. I think everybody should download I'm downloading it when it's done, I, when this podcast is over. Like my quest has always been about driving awareness. And awareness was slow for many, many years. And then since 2018, it, it's really taken off. So part of it, that was just only one of me, even though we have a lot of instructors. But how can we put all of the exercise into an app? So we put 100 different exercise sequences into the app. And we also have about 30 different sequences or individual properties. So for example, somebody with panic disorder with dysfunctional breathing, somebody with anxiety, somebody who's doing it for athletic performance, somebody with sleep apnea, snoring, blood pressure, high blood pressure, etc. You put in your details and that will give you a specific exercise to do in the morning, afternoon and evening. And it changes it and it's designed to develop habits. Mm -hmm. So the whole app was, to be honest with you, part of it was I give corporate talks and I'm giving talks to different individuals. I talked about the stuff, but then after I left, I was thinking, well, is that it? So now I can talk about it and then they can download a free app. Everything in it is free. There's no subscription. And then they can follow what I'm talking about in the app. So that's the idea. That is awesome. And you said something as somebody that builds technology. That's what I do now. You eventually get limited by hours. If you're the only one that can deliver the message, and now you have a tool which can reach many more yes. people, and I think that that's that's awfully generous of you. I'm going to download the app. We'll put a link in the show notes. But what are you excited about now? What are you cooking up? Are, is there something new you're working on? Or are you still just focusing on the breath and sharing that? Because there's a lot of people that need to learn about it. Yeah, you know, breathing is one of those things. Like the more you're in it, the more you realize what you don't know. And there's always new stuff coming out in it. So I'm currently, I've just written a book, Breathing for Yoga, which is really interesting. It's 190,000 words. It's about 520 pages, 800 references. And I looked at, because breathing is taught in yoga for hundreds and thousands of years, but breathing in yoga was light breathing up until 1880. And in 1880, there was a movement called the hygienic movement in Europe, and people were dying with tuberculosis. And an idea took hold that in order to prevent germs from spreading throughout the body, you had to take these full big breaths. You hear yourself breathing. You're breathing more air than what you need. And this idea then traveled from Europe to India. And it actually changed yoga breathing in India. So breathing in yoga changed from being subtle and light and conservation of the breath and tolerance to, keep to carbon dioxide to the opposite. Mm. And now we want to bring it full circle. So I understand there's some yoga instructors get this, but there's many who don't. We went in on YouTube, just as an example. Seven out of 10 instructors were talking about taking full big breaths. In other words, encouraging over breathing mm. as opposed to the opposite in terms of improving oxygen delivery throughout the body. Wow. What's the name of the book again? Breathing for Yoga. Breathing for Yoga. All right, we'll put that yes. in the show notes as well. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I hate to say fan because in the world of science, I, you know, fan, whatever, but your book is phenomenal. People should buy the book, put the practices put, you, and get the app and then put these things into practice. Like I used to mouth breathe. When I started reading your book, I made a conscious effort to switch to nasal breathing and it has made a tremendous impact on me. And so I have you to thank for that. And thank you for coming on the blueprint today. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks so much, Eric. It's been brilliant. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed this little series with Patrick, please do a couple things. One, follow him, check out his free app, and please leave us a comment and review on whichever listening platform you are joining us from, as this makes a tremendous difference in our ability to bring people like Patrick on the show and reach more folks with the important message of the Blueprint. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode.